my fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, I'm here tonight again to address the opposition. And my opposition is not this crazy woman dressed as wildlife that I encountered as a ranger at Crater Lake National Park. My opposition is someone in this room. And no, it's not Steve Winheim. No, it's not James Bubash. No, it's not Howard Brandt. It is my friend and fellow Toastmaster, Adam Patel. For the past four years, I have given over a dozen speeches on various aspects of climate change. And after hearing all these speeches, Adam wants me to address how can climate scientists possibly know what is going to happen in the future? And Adam, I think that's an excellent question. How can any of us, especially climate scientists, know what's going to happen in the future? Because all of us can think of times in our life where human beings were wrong. For instance, when I was a kid in the 1970s, and wasn't I a cute kid? I remember in fourth grade health class, the teacher and the students talking about smoking cigarettes. And I remember some of the teacher or some of the students, or even adults at the time, saying, I have a great uncle or grandfather living in his 80s. He's been smoking cigarettes his whole life, and he doesn't have any health issues. And as a kid, I thought that was ridiculous. But today, with all we know, most of us can agree that smoking cigarettes regularly can lead to various health hazards, some of them life-threatening. Even more, this organization, the AAAS, also known as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in March 2014, exactly one year ago, they released this statement which they said, doctors, cardiovascular scientists, and public health experts all agree that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. The same agreement exists among climate scientists, over 97%, and over 60% of meteorologists that maintains that climate change exists and human activity is the cause. <coughs> and after studying the Earth's climate, climate scientists are very worried about the amount of dirty pollution that we're putting in our air supply by burning coal, oil, and natural gas for our energy use. Well, who here enjoys watching National Geographic or Discovery Channel shows? Well, in 2008, I saw a National Geographic program that changed my life, that had a huge impact on me. It was called Six Degrees Could Change the World. And this program talked about how, based upon what scientists know about the Earth's climate, the program lays out how scientists expect what could happen with each degree rise in temperature if we do not reduce our pollution. For instance, if the Earth warms at just one degree Celsius, which would be about two degrees Fahrenheit, the result could be severe droughts in the U.S. Great Plains. And these prolonged droughts could, caught, could turn some of America's most productive farmland and ranch land into deserts, causing shortages in the global grain and meat markets. And this especially concerns me for our Midwest economy. If the world warms by 2 degrees Celsius, many scientists are, are worried it could cause a collapse of the world's coral reefs which is a nursery for millions, if not billions, of sea life and marine, marine organisms. And keep this in mind, folks. Since 1880, with the Industrial Revolution, with burning coal, oil, and gasoline, half of the carbon dioxide that's gone up into our air has actually ended up in the oceans, changing the water chemistry in what scientists refer to as ocean acidification. And this ocean acidification is making it harder for organisms such as sea butterflies for their, for, to can actually create their shells. It's actually dissolving their calcium carbonate shells that change in ocean chemistry, water chemistry. But it's not just the bottom of the, sea, the food chain. It, this also affects the seafood that we love to eat. 
such as clams. So this change in ocean chemistry is also breaking down the clams and also delicious Maryland crab. Anybody ever had Maryland crab in Chesapeake Bay? And for me, I'm very concerned because I love to eat seafood. I still have great memories in 2004 going to an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet in Everglades City, Florida. Didn't I have beautiful hair then? And so I love to eat seafood. So I'm very worried about that. I'm also worried about the billions of people on the planet that, that actually use the oceans to get food. There too. If the world warms by three degrees, the result could be severe fires, so bad that it could poten potentially burn down the Amazon rainforest. And Susan, you gave an excellent speech about that, the Amazon rainforest over a month ago. They're the lungs of the earth. They're so important to maintain and protect. If the world warms by four degrees Celsius, the concern is that it could melt the West Antarctic ice sheet, that area inside that red oval there. And if the West Antarctic ice sheet collapses, it could raise sea level worldwide by 16 feet. Now, what does that mean, 16 feet? Well, this is Florida, where Adam's from. And this is what the sea, le sea level looks like today on the coastline. But with a 16-foot rise in sea level, with the West Antarctic sheet collapsing, this is what it could look like in a few hundred years or so. And this really worries me, because I spent 16 years working in the Florida Everglades, at the very bottom of the state of Florida. And keep this in mind, folks. If we go four degrees or greater, some scientists are concerned it could cause a collapse of the entire Antarctic ice sheet and the entire ice on Greenland. And if that happens, sea levels would rise worldwide 216 feet. Now, what does that mean, 216 feet? Well, in September of 2013, this was actually the cover of National Geographic. Shows how high the sea level would be on the Statue of Liberty, almost up to her belly. And as far as the coast of the United States, this is what it would look like. Basically, you'd have no more Florida, no more Louisiana on the East Coast, basically no more Baltimore, Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston on the West Coast, no more Los parts of Los Angeles would be gone, parts of the San Francisco Bay Area and Central California. All those millions of people would have to relocate somewhere. And imagine the stress on our St. Louis community having to absorb millions of climate refugees. <laughs> if the world warms by five or six degrees, scientists don't even want to think about it. Because then we're possibly threatening the collapse of our civilization. This is how another Adam described it. Adam Frank, he's an astrophysicist at the University of Rochester. The danger is not to, to our planet, but to our civilization on the planet. Now, someone to help crystallize this thought for me was Dr. Richard Somerville. He's now retired. He's a climate scientist at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And so speaking of how bad it could get for our civilization, this is how he described it. The elaborate pumps, dams, canals, and reservoirs won't work under extreme climate change with the floods, droughts, and heat waves because they were designed for the climate that we had, not for the climate that we're going to have. So Adam, and Steve, and Howard, and Jim, and others here, to answer your question, how how can scientists possibly know what's going to happen in the future? Well, they've studied the ancient climates and the climate system today, and they're very worried about the negative impacts, the nasty consequences that could happen. And I'm very worried about the nasty consequences that could possibly happen for my nieces and nephews. And Adam, you brought your children to some of our Toastmasters meetings. You have beautiful kids. I don't want anything bad happening to them, too. So hopefully we can learn to work together on solutions to climate change. And for all of us here, hopefully all of us can find ways to reduce our opposition, find common ground, work together on solutions, and reduce our pollution to make it a healthier planet for our children and <coughs> grandchildren. So uh, this, is, this ends the, the formal part of my speech. 
And so now, how am I doing, Madam Time? Can, I'm, can you reset the, t the clock for three minutes? And so now I want to open up to your questions here, especially Adam, since I did this speech for you tonight. Sure. And how can I help you, Adam? And I, and I know you asked me to sort of keep the question short. So sure, no, no problem. <laughs> so, so my concern is that well, I think all of us know what the difference between a, a chiropractor and a, and a medical doctor is a lot of us don't trust chiropractors. We think of them as quacks, and they're yeah. less of a mature practice than medical doctors. Mm -hmm. And I would say the same thing about climatologists versus meteorologists. So mm -hmm. why would we trust climatologists when the more mature science of meteorology, mm -hmm. when there's a lot less of a belief that that climate change is human caused in the, in the meteorology field. Gosh, I guess I'll have to pick your brain more on this question. I think what, what, what a lot of people don't know is that climate science has been around basically as, wrong, as, as long as meteorology. Basically the first person that kind of came up with the concept for climate science, it, it kind of dates back to John Tyndall, and there's even a, a fellow before him called Joseph Fourier, but I may be mispronouncing that name. But John Tyndall is, is significant because he was the first person to actually, he forced different gases in tubes, such as carbon dioxide and other, and other ga gases, and he determined that certain gases actually, what they do is they actually absorb heat. And so he was able to come up with the greenhouse effect. And actually in 1896, Cervantes Arrhenius, a Swedish um, scientist, and I forget what he, I think he was a chemist, I could be wrong about that though, he was the first person to put together the hypothesis is if we keep burning coal and keep burning, burning different fossil fuels, then what's going to happen is that we're going to keep putting more of that blanket in our atmosphere and it's going to cause warming. Now he was from Sweden, so he thought global warming would be great. But climate science has, it has actually been pretty much been around since meteorology. And then there's been other people since then. So I don't know if exactly how that answers your question sure. there. There too. Yeah. Other questions you may have for me. Was that was anything else, Aaron? No. That's fine. Okay. Did you have a Did you have a question for me? I have a question. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much for your yeah. speech and facts. You talked a lot about kind of the doomsday scenarios yes. of, of global warming mm -hmm. and global climate mm -hmm. climate change. Yeah. You talked a lot about all our interactions as humans mm -hmm. and how they contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Could you please talk about things like uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, Mount St. Helens, different, different volcanoes and, and the gases that are released into the atmosphere and how they impact the temperature mm -hmm. of the earth compared to human? That's a release. great question there, Patrick. If you, I, I would encourage you to look up the US Geological Survey. I actually did, did a survey on this and apparently Right now, human beings admit, admit with our burning of fossil fuels, a hundred times more carbon dioxide than volcanoes do. And what volcanoes do, like Mount St. Helens and Mount Pinatubo, I believe it was in the Philippines in 1982, they actually cool the planet when they erupt. They don't warm the planet, they cool the planet. So we're actually putting out right now a hundred times more CO2 than volcanoes currently are. And so the red light just came on for me. So unfortunately, I don't have more time to answer more questions right now. But you guys have been a wonderful group, especially Adam here tonight.